Hello and welcome everybody to today's Lagos Live. Um, I am here with Dr. John Kleinig and I'm excited to get introduce all, uh, him to all of you. Um, thank you all so much for being here with us this, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever you are. Um, and so before we really jump in, what I would love to hear from you is where you are tuning in from. But before you really get into it, I also want to know where you wish you were. So for us here in the States, yesterday was a holiday and I'm still kind of on holiday mode. And so if any of you are with me, feel free to drop in the comments. Let me know where you wish you were. Um, I am tuning in from Texas, so it is nice and toasty here. Um, Dr. Kleinig, I believe you're in Australia. Is that right? That is right. Right. And uh, uh, down under, down under, the middle of, if you get Australia, it's like Texas in Australia. <laughs> That's saying a lot because we already have an awful lot in common. <laughs> Indeed. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kleinig. We're going to run through just kind of a little bit of your background. So folks tuning in, um, know a little bit about you and about the topic that we're going to be talking through today. So um, Dr. Kleinig is a pastor of the Lutheran Church in Australia and has served as a high school chaplain and, and parish pastor. So he has lived a lot of the experiences that we're going to be talking about today and has been in, uh, involved in the preparation of students as ordination, sorry, in preparation for um, of students for ordination as pastors for over 25 years at Lutheran at Luther Seminary in Adelaide. Um, he's retired now, but he's written tons of books and articles. Um, one of the most recent books is called Wonderfully Made, which is actually what we're going to be talking about quite a bit today. Um, and most recently, he published God's Word, A Guide to Holy Scripture in the Christian Essentials series from Lexham Press. Um, he's been in the U.S. quite a bit and has worked with Doxology, the Lutheran uh, Center for Spiritual Care and Counsel, and has been regular speaker at his conferences, which I believe you work with, maybe is it uh, Dr. Harold Sinkbile at those conferences? That's right. Yes, he's a dear yep. friend. Yes, we love him here at Lagos. He's fantastic. Um, and by training, I understand you're an Old Testament theologian, but also you've spent a lot of time on other parts of the Bible, including pastoral theology. Um, and with a PhD from the University of Cambridge, honorary doctorates from Concordia in Fort Wayne, Concordia and Irvine, you have done it all academically. And so we're so blessed to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. And for those of you who are tuning in, um, we are in at the very beginning of creation month at Lagos um, on word by word, we take a topic each month and we spend a lot of time just going deeper into um, various aspects of the topic. So July is creation for us. And we're talking to Dr. Kleinick today because of his book, Wonderfully Made from Lexham Press, in which he talks quite a bit about our bodies, what it means to be created and what our bodies actually say about our creator. And so as we jump in, Dr. Kleinig, I would love to hear a little bit more about the book. Um, can you tell us why you wrote it? And the title itself reminds me of Psalm 139, Wonderfully Made. And so I would love to hear a little bit of not just why you wrote it, but also where that title and that central theme came from. Yes, this has uh, the book has a rather odd origin. Um, uh, and it's a bit convoluted. It started off when uh, Dr. Zenkbal, who you mentioned, and uh, two other uh, uh, Lutheran uh, theologians uh, attended a ecumenical um, consultation. And it was ecumenical right across the board. And the consultation, as far as I know, was uh, hosted by Josh McDowell, a very prominent evangelical theologian. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, convened to discuss the issue of pornography, um, uh, which has uh, plagued our Western societies and goes from bad to worse. It used to be basically that men were uh, access pornography, now increasingly women access pornography. And one of the sad things about it is that uh, it um, is very damaging. 
uh, in many, on, on, almost at every level, it's damaging, and yet it's 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 uh, addictive. Um, now, um, most of the speakers at this conference dealt with it, uh, if you like, from a technical, um, secular, or a moral point of view. Um, uh, there, uh, of all the speakers, there was only one, according to uh, Dr. Sengpal, that really uh, uh, was very helpful in a positive pastoral way in nailing the issue. And this was from a Catholic theologian who based his presentation on uh, Pope John Paul's very, very influential uh, series of uh, talks, which then uh, were brought into a book called the theology of the body, which has influenced um, techno theologians around the world. Now, uh, Pope John Paul comes from it from a very much from a Catholic point of view and dealing with uh, uh, Catholic questions and more um, philosophically than biblically, although uh, 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 it's very, very good. Um, so at the end of that uh, consultation, they had to report back to their um, uh, officials who uh, encouraged them to attend and said, uh, what would they recommend? And they said, look, what we need is, is somebody to write a biblical theology of the body and an evangelical biblical theology. The, which it concentrates on the gospel and not just the law and isn't legalistic and moralistic. So um, they got funding. Uh, they proposed that and funding was uh, they, from somewhere they got the funding for it. And uh, they asked me whether I would write a book on pornography. Now, the last thing I want to write is a book on pornography. Goodness gracious me. Uh, uh, not because it, I, I am embarrassed to speak about the topic or that I've had no experience in counselling people on it, but uh, the, the problem is, and I've found this from experience, that if you deal with it just in isolation, you get nowhere, and you get nowhere spiritually. In fact, very often it makes bad worse. Uh, so uh, we had some negotiation. I said, look... Uh, yeah, I'm happy to write on this topic, but it was, must be within a larger framework. Because my contention, and this is, runs all the way through the book, is that um, uh, pornography is at base a spiritual issue. And it has to do, and we can't deal with it unless we understand the human body and human sexuality uh, uh, more broadly. Uh, no, the very fact that God created us as male and female and uh, gave us the gift of sexuality and the power to procreate. And uh, 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 the only, you know, this needs to be understood within a larger uh, biblical, spiritual uh, framework, theological framework. So I said, look, I'll deal with the issue but only uh, if I can write a book on the body. And they said, yay, yay, that's what we want. Um, and so that's how this has come about. If you look at the book, um, uh, it's interesting. People who get hold of the book and it looks like this, um, uh, look at the index and they see, oh, sex. Oh, interesting. So they page and they say, uh, look at uh, the sexual body page 147. Guess what they do? Go straight there. Now, I don't mind because what they do then is to go back and read the whole book. But I didn't want to start there uh, because uh, uh, that, in my experience, gets into a dead end. Um, so uh, um, I agreed then to write this book. Uh, and my aim was uh, basically pastoral and spiritual to help people 
um, not to be moralistic and to wag my finger and uh, you know, assume moral high ground as if uh, this is no problem to me and I've got all the answers, but to put it within a, a larger framework. And you mentioned the title um, and you recognise that it comes from Psalm 139. The book's called Wonderfully Made. And that deliberately echoes what um, uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verses 13 uh, through to 18. You, God, form me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, that's the title, I praise you. And the book, is, if you like, is a book of praise. Um, in a way, a praise of the human body, but praise of God, who's invented this amazing creation, the human body. Now, I've got two sons who are medical specialists, and they... Um, uh, uh, in talking with them, they say, yeah, look, uh, the more we study the human body, the, just from a physical point of view, the more mysterious and wonderful it is. So I praise you for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame, my skeleton, was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Uh, the, here, the womb is uh, like the mother earth for the formation of a baby. Your eyes, and this is what's important here, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they are more than sand. I awake and I'm still with you. Um, now, uh, here you get uh, the, uh, the praise of God for the formation of the human body with a little embryo in mother's womb. And, how, uh, uh, and that's part of the larger picture in the psalm, as God, who, who is the only person who sees us entirely. Now, I can't see myself. It's interesting. God's constructed us so that we can see other people, but we can't see ourselves. And even when we look at ourselves in the mirror, it's two-dimensional and it's reversed. Uh, uh, the only way that I can see myself is through the eyes of another person. And no human being can see me entirely. They can see me outwardly, my appearance. Um, the only, uh, and no one can see my whole life. All they see is me, uh, you looking now, can see my face and part of my body, if you like an image of me, uh, but you can't see the whole of me. Uh, and the most important part of me as a human being is not the visible part, but the invisible part um, uh, of me. Uh, so the, uh, and you can only see me in this place and at this time. The only one who can see us completely, the whole person for the whole life from beginning to end, is God. Um, so um, this book is about vision, uh, uh, if you like body image, vision, the vision that we have of our bodies, the way we see ourselves. Uh, and the most important uh, bottom line is that we can't see ourselves, only God sees us completely. Uh, and uh, 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 so uh, uh, he's the only one who has the true vision of us, who sees us inwardly and outwardly, outwardly and entirely. The original title that I proposed was Wonderfully Made on Seeing Our Bodies as God Sees Them. 
Now, the marketing guys at Lexham uh, uh, were a bit spooked by this. This sounded too academic or, or theologic. And they wanted to make a connection with uh, um, uh, Pope John Paul's theology of the body. So you have the subtitle, A Protestant Theology of the Body. It's not really a Protestant theology of the body. It's a biblical theology of the body. And I've run it past Catholic friends of, that I have, and they say, well, this Protestant, you, uh, it's, it's the Christian, Catholic, uh, biblical vision of the body. But uh, uh, if you like, that's the basic uh, 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 image, if you like, picture um, uh, of the book. So that God uh, created us. Uh, he uh, had us in mind, and from the beginning, he saw what he wanted to make and what he wanted to make of us. He sees us as created in his image. He sees us as fallen creatures. He sees us as redeemed in Jesus. He sees us as saved from bodily corruption, damage, and he sees us holy sanctified and he sees us resurrected for eternal life so he sees the whole of us and uh, if we are going to understand uh, and see ourselves as god sees us we've got to see ourselves within that whole picture if you like yeah there's that's so beautiful and it kind of gets to something that I saw in your book, which is um, a remarkable appreciation for bodies. Yes. Um, there's no fear of the body being a body as yes. it is. There's no um, minimization of, yeah, we have bodies, but we are souls, which is something yes. that a popular writer, I believe, wrote. Yes. Um there's not really the separation, but as you noted in your um, brief exposition of Psalm 139, but that, that God sees the entirety of us. Yes. Um, and it, it really stuck out to me as I was reading your book, um, how you were intentionally trying to craft a positive vision of how bodies are, uh, I mean, just what bodies are to begin with, how yes. central it is that we have bodies, that we yes. were created within bodies, um, and that that is a good thing. Yes. Um, and hearing you talk about the origin of this book and um, it coming out of a specific request to write something pastoral about pornography that isn't just do better. We've all heard those sermons, the books yes. exist, they're everywhere, you know, but there's so much more to a positive understanding of the body and what God created it for and what it actually tells us that we can know about God um, that I appreciate that you hit on in the book. Um, so can you maybe help us understand a little bit of um, what it what it is, what what it looks like to create that positive vision within ourselves of understanding our bodies without falling into the popular body positivity sort of language yes. that is currently circulating. Yes. Um, uh, one of the odd things about our society is that all of us, uh, and it used to be most women were dissatisfied with the way they appeared with their bodies and had a negative image of themselves. Uh, now it's, it's also increasingly most young men would trade in their bodies for some um, ideal body. Uh, now, um, uh, one of the funny aspects of our human condition is that we oscillate from adoration of the body to disgust with the body. And that can flip within five minutes from one to the other. Uh, we are dissatisfied with our bodies and uh, uh, we don't like the way we look. And we have this ideal body that we try and copy. And so you get 
makeup and surgery and dressing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we're afraid of aging because we lose our appearance and we are the way we look and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have this dissatisfaction with our bodies, which is really an index of our dissatisfaction, not with just with our bodies and the way we look, but with ourselves and what we are as human beings. There's deep within us a realisation that we are not as we were meant to be. And we do the same for other people. We're very critical. I mean, just think of women, how critical they are, not only of themselves, but other women and of men and the way they appear. And that's everybody. We're critical of the way people look, but we assume that the way people look is the way we are. And that's the real issue uh, is that we are not as we were meant to be. And uh, so we need to start off at that point is uh, uh, what were, what did God intend with our bodies? What are they for? And this is where we have an asset as Christians that I wish we could get out and shout from the mountaintops. Um, uh, uh, because at a time when people are obsessed with bodies or disgusted with bodies, we have a wonderful middle road. We can appreciate bodies, but we can also see that our bodies are now not the way they were originally meant to be. And at every level, physically um, through to the personal level. Uh, and so uh, the starting point for me is uh, the story of creation. Uh, and the fact that uh, you have this big picture of God creating the great cosmos with everything in it. And then it narrows down and says that the uh, everything is there, the whole order and that amazing cosmos is all there. Uh, uh, the, on, on top of that, this kind of a pyramid is uh, it's all focuses on God's creation of human beings. And human beings in his image, in his likeness. Now, that's the foundation for everything. Uh, that God created human beings in his image. Secondly, it's not only created human beings, but he created them male and female. And then the story goes on further uh, uh, that he created male and female for sexual union. Uh, for marriage, and sexual union is is uh, uh, has to do uh, uh, not just with reproduction, but it has to do with a impossible equation or uh, impossible maths, where one and one becomes not two but one. So um, bodies were made, and this is the language of. Uh, Pope John Paul, uh, 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 is they were spousal. They, each of us was created, male or female, a he or a she, uh, have you like to put it, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, we were created sexually, for physical union with each other. And out of that physical union comes um, uh, marriage, and uh, uh, then also family and children. So you get that one flesh union. So uh, the pivotal passage there is uh, uh, the statement in Genesis, because Eve was taken from Adam and from the side of Adam, uh, so they were uh, uh, meant for each other. And then God says, therefore, a man leaves his father and mother which is the opposite to what usually happens. A man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife. Clings, cling is, is negative, uh, uh, is stuck with his wife, and the two become one flesh. And then Jesus picks it up in the New Testament. God joins together, let no man put us under. So the picture here in Genesis is of God as the marriage ceremony celebrant uh, 
he presides over the union of every man and every woman, not just Christian, but every man, every woman in the world. And this is the focus of his creation. Uh, it's not just for sexual reproduction. We can understand that, if you like, biologically. But it is for that union of two people. And what's interesting is they are opposites. They're not like, no, uh, the union of same beings, but opposite beings. They are complementary. They're like two halves of a circle uh, that are joined together and become a full circle. And then going on a bit further, then the culmination of, so the culmination, if you like, of God's creation is the creation of man, uh, of man and woman in God's image, the creation of woman and the creation of marriage and the union then of opposites and that polarity, that wonderful physical polarity that drives society. It's interesting how that's borne out by, uh, despite the modern ideologies, uh, by certain facts. Uh, now, say, I immediately... Uh, uh, there's been studies done, it's that the first thing that human beings do when they meet an adult or even young one, the first classification they do is, is it a man, is it a woman? So I see you and immediately a PSA woman. I see Jason and I say man. Um, uh, 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 that we are wired uh, to recognise each other. And that's part of God's design God's purpose. Now, if that's the case, then sex, sexual reproduction, the physical body, the way we appear, our sexual organs are all part of God's design. Um, and they are nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, on the opposite, uh, they are something to be proud of or pleased with. God's pleased with me, my body, He's pleased with my sexuality uh, and my wife's sexuality. And he uh, looks at it and he says, it's very good. So that's the focus, if you like, of the whole book is the goodness of the body. Um, at a time when many people are not only disgusted with their bodies, but they feel that their bodies are not really them. I'm a bit of a connoisseur of sweatshirts, um, not just for what's in them, but, uh, but uh, uh, because what they tell me about people and the way people present themselves. Uh, uh, one of the ones that I saw recently from a very attractive young woman was, this is not me, exclamation mark. Now she was very buxom and attractive, but if you like, that's the message. Uh, uh, there's two contradictory messages that we make. Uh, okay, this is me, this is all I am, is my body, or my body is not me, this is not me. This is me. But there's more to me than what you see. Yeah, so you mentioned in the book, and this just reminds me of something that I heard growing up and a phrase that could be used to cover all manner of sins. Um, it's all going to burn anyway. Um, oh, like I, I heard that in Sunday school referring to, um, you know, who cares if you recycle, it's all going to burn. Um, but yeah. it's a general interaction with the physical world, our bodies included of it's all going to it's all going to burn this is just going to be discarded but part of what you're getting at is that our bodies have a different kind of value and you mentioned in the book um this is a quote um that our bodies were made to bridge two realms the invisible eternal realm of god and the visible temporal realm of his creation um and so can you help us understand a little bit of um why our bodies matter out, not just to this specific moment that we are in, but that there's something bigger that we are a part of with our bodies. 
Yes, um, and that's the big issue uh, uh, that uh, uh, we face in our society. And here we touch on theology, uh, the theological issues. Uh, uh, the it's God create didn't just create the and this is the story of Genesis if he, again. Um, he didn't just create our bodies as very good, but the whole of his creation is good. The goodness of the physical world. When God looks at the physical world, he's pleased with it. It's part of his grand design. Now, his grand design is that he created the whole, and this is mind-boggling, uh, that he created the whole of the physical world. He, he created us, and I'll come to this in a minute, uh, for eternity. Come to that. Uh, but he also created the whole physical world in some way for eternity. Paul talks about the whole of creation groaning uh, as it waits for the adoption of the children of God, because with that then, God, if you like, redeems and draws the whole of the created world into eternity. That's the big picture. Okay, so matter matters. The world matters to God intensely. Uh, uh, and it's part of his grand design um, that is simply amazing. That's the vision, or that's the big vision. Now, the little vision of you and me is that we were made in the image of God. Now, um, uh, uh, the language is very precise. Uh, uh, it's not that we were made the image of God, but we were made in the image of God. Now, there's a difference between being the image and in the image. The image means it's a reflection of the real thing, which is the image. Uh, so if you go, uh, and here I'm jumping ahead to the full story of the Bible, uh, well, if, if we were made in the image of God, what's the image of God? New Testament said it's Jesus, the man Jesus, with his human body that was conceived in the womb of Mary and was crucified, buried, dead, buried, and resurrected, and taken up into eternity. Um, so human beings were made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? On the most obvious level, it means that they are meant to reflect God in some way. Um, uh, so we take we say oh you know that, that people look at my uh daughters and they look at my wife and they say oh yes she's a chip of the old block uh no they look they see my wife reflected in my children and grandchildren uh, and that's only m minimally but god is invisible it's he's unseen god created human beings with physical bodies to reflect him, to show his glory. And his glory is no, his, his greatness, his goodness, but also uh, 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 his radiance, his presence. So no matter where you look in creation, you can't see God. You can deduce that there's a creator, but you can't see God. <coughs> Human beings and pagan people then look for some part of creation saying, this is what God's like. He's like the sun. And you could understand that. that but no, the Bible says, no, look, uh, even though the whole creation is uh, in some way shows the creator, but it, it, none of it is, is in the image of God. It's only human beings. So human beings are meant to show God to show, you know, in school we used to have show and tell sessions. Uh, human beings were created for by God for show and tell, uh, to uh, uh, show each other, and then also the whole world, the animals and the plants. This is what God is like. This no, this is not God. No human beings. God. Well, yeah, we come back to that. There is a human being who's God, and that's Jesus. But no 
other human being is the image of God, but every human being is in the image of God. Um, uh, and uh, so if you want to know God and see God, uh, if you want to have a vision of God, a theophany, an epiphany, uh, uh, you look at human beings. And even fallen human beings reflect something of God. Now, Genesis uh, unpacks that uh, being made in the image of God uh, in a number of ways. First of all, it, it says that uh, it's not just each individual is in the image of God, but man and woman together are in the image of God. So if you want to see what God's like, don't just look at this man, this woman, but look at this married couple and see this man and this woman together are in the image of God. Right? So it's, it's corporate uh, because God is not just one person, it's three persons. He's a community. And so uh, the nature of God is reflected in that. Now, there's a number of different levels to this. First of all, since the against God, uh, which were, who were meant to show the nature of God, what God was like as a person, uh, 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 no longer reflect God completely and accurately. Uh, we are not, you know, we might do the same things that God does, but we can't see, um, uh, we can't see what God's like by looking at human beings. We don't see God's holiness. We don't see God's righteousness. That's been lost. But there's other parts to the image of God that are, are still remain, even in the most evil people, wicked people, because uh, the the uh, that's unpacked in Genesis and say, God saying, saying, the first uh, God blesses human beings, and He says, be fruitful and multiply. So in procreation, we reflect what God does. Notice the term procreation. God's the only person who can create. Uh, 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 anybody, uh, uh, God and God, but God uses physical means to create things. Uh, and God uses human beings to create human beings, procreation. Uh, and so in procreation, uh, where you have a man and a woman having a child, raising a child in a family, you uh, get a picture of what God is like in what he does. So in procreation. Uh, then also, uh, that's, if you like, uh, we've lost the ability to, to reflect God, if you like, uh, vertically, uh, higher up, upwards, uh, but we've still maintained that uh, 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 horizontally. And then uh, uh, the other thing that God says to, to Adam and Eve that they were to be not only fruitful and multiply, but to subdue the earth and to rule over the animals. So they, uh, we are like God in caring. For the earth in the pursuit of agriculture. Now God is, if you like, the farmer, the gardener, um, the park ranger, uh, but human beings were to work with God in caring for the world, God's world, not their world, not exploiting it, but uh, and in agriculture so that the resources of the world will be used for the benefit of everybody. Uh, and secondly, to rule over the animals in uh, not just an agriculture, uh, but then also an animal husbandry. So uh, those are, if you like, the uh, dimensions of uh, uh, the uh, being created in the image of God. And all that is 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 physical, is bodily. I mean, it's quite obviously you can't rule over animals mentally. Uh, you can't uh, uh, farm a piece of land mentally. 
although there's a lot of lazy people who'd like to do that, uh, 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 you can't reproduce, you can't create a human being um, in any other way except through sexual intercourse and where it's mimicked or where it's aped in, uh, by stealing it from its context. So human beings created in the image of God. That's their glory. And uh, uh, that's what makes us different to everything else in God's creation. And it's that then which um, then shows our identity and our destiny. And then what's our destiny? Well, our destiny is that we, our bodies were created in the image of God for eternal life with God. We were created body and soul, uh, uh, one being together uh, for eternal life with God. And so uh, uh, the goal of humanity is, is the redemption of the body, and not just the body, but the whole person, body, soul, spirit, redeeming for eternal life with God. And that eternal life is physical in the sense that it involves our bodies. Not the, not, not the body exactly the same as it is now because it's been damaged and scarred, but our transformed, our transfigured, our perfected bodies. Our, uh, just as Jesus' body was transformed um, from just, you know, if you looked at Jesus, you say there's just another human being. But then through his resurrection, then his body is glorified. There's one place in the gospel where you get the, the disciples got a glimpse that Jesus is more than just a man, is at the transfiguration. And that uh, points then to the destiny of our human bodies. They are to be transfigured from being lowly, mortal, to being immortal uh, for life with God. And our life with God will be spiritual, sure, we'll be in the Holy Spirit, but will be physical. And uh, uh, we won't... Um, and. Uh, we won't uh, be transformed into angels. We won't be denuded, but we will be transformed as men and women uh, with perfect bodies. That's the body, you know, that God designed for us to have and that we will see our bodies and other people will see our bodies as God meant them to be only in eternity. Sorry, that's a long waffle there from a waffler. No, I mean, I think there's so much there that's essential for us to understand the difference between being made in the image of God versus being the image of God, yeah. as Colossians 1 refers to Jesus. Yes. Um, the so, purpose. The visible, of, and what I like there is that's very precise. Uh, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Yeah. Now, yeah. there you, though, you say those two realms together, the heavenly realm, the earthly realm, the only thing that mirror, you know, that cuts across that great divide uh, uh, is uh, Jesus and his human body and the fact that our human bodies are united with his human body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have one question on that topic, but before we get to that one, I just want to come back to one thing that I thought as you were um, talking through um, the previous answer. So um, you mentioned how um, the image of God is reflected in marriage, in yes. procreation. I would also be curious to hear how you would talk about the image of God in, as regarding single people who... Um, through no sin of their own, no fault of their own, are not married, yeah. but will not be imaging God in the form of procreation. Yes, there's a, a section on the book uh, on singlehood, uh, and it's interesting that in the feedback that I've got, some of the most positive, even gushing appreciation has come from single people. Uh, if there's one thing... Uh, that characterizes, uh, you know, if you like, many, you know, broadly Protestant 
um, Christianity is it's 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 in in the attempt to show uh, the value of marriage and having families and children, unintentionally it belittles singlehood. Now, um, uh, the one per, uh, a thinker who's basically thought this through um, and is the stimulus for a uh, what I wrote there is Pope John Paul. Interestingly enough, a celibate person, a monk, uh, with an appreciation then for the single life. Uh, you know, uh, that uh, 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 marriage is a vocation, but singlehood is equally a vocation. Now, he talks about the, and this is very helpful, he, he talks about um, uh, the original state of human beings is single. So we were single, even those of us who are married, were single before we were married. And most of us will eventually be single at the end of our marriages. It's very rare that both husband and wife die together. Um, so if I look at my congregation that I'm a member of, we have more single people than we have married people. And yet the problem is that uh, when you hear sermons and hear teaching, the assumption seems to be that everybody is married. Now, um, uh, uh, now, if we could go back to what I said, uh, the original condition of human beings is being single. Um, uh, sexual, but single. You know, we are man and woman and singlehood. <clears throat> now, the Bible teaches, if you like, uh, and this is... John Paul's uh, uh, formulation, he talks about the spousal nature of the human body. Uh, whether we are uh, married or single, we are made for the opposite sex. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 and uh, what's, uh, what's entailed here? Well, uh, uh, Eventually, you know, marriage as we know it and sexual intercourse in marriage for reproduction uh, is only for time. It's not for eternity. And it's only for a limited period. You know, there's a time when I was not sexually mature and or sexually inactive. There's a time at the end of our lives where even that ends before our lives end. Uh, so we... Uh, but the enduring condition, if you like, of, of uh, every human being is that the spousal, that we were created for the opposite sex. And that the opposite, that singlehood reflects, if you like, our relationship with God. Um, uh, and the danger is that we connect um, it too closely with marriage, and we have the you know the picture of Jesus the bridegroom, the church is the bride, uh, but we don't realise that uh, there's two parts to it. The other picture is that of picture of a betrothal engagement, uh, espousement that that all of us are meant to be, if you like, engaged to Jesus, and. Uh, 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 that the image of God and our vocation is not exclusively uh, ma marital, but all of us were created for each other and as men and women. Well, what does a, a single person mirror? Uh, it reflects uh, certain aspects of our relationship with Jesus and with God. So I'm a man, my relationship with Jesus is if you like spiritually um, that I'm his bride or part of his bride, but physically he is my friend. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, so you have that image of friendship uh, and friendship across the sexes. And that reflects then, if you like, the image of God. Now, that's quite complicated. What I'd urge people to do that interested in is just read the chapter on singlehood. Uh, 
because uh, there's so many different aspects to it that's very, very important. Uh, but uh, whether we are single or married, individually, we were meant for a physical relationship and even, in a sense, a sexual relationship, in the sense of a, a um, uh, relationship with us in our uh, sexuality with Jesus and with God the Father uh, uh, as uh, espoused and for physical union with, e with e each other and for physical friendship and for uh, uh, physical relationship with Jesus. Just a bit of a side, I, you know, one of the most moving uh, uh, feedbacks that I got from uh, a reader of the book was from a single woman who uh, uh, you know, always wanted to be married, but it just didn't happen. And she said, yes, that she has uh, not just a, if you like, a spiritual relationship with Jesus, but she has a physical relationship with Jesus um, as her bridegroom. And she sees that most clearly when she in worship and particularly in Holy Communion, and that there is a physical union that she can enjoy with Jesus at the Lord's table. A very moving uh, testimony that I got from her. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I want to just wrap up with one question. Um, and you kind of touched on this a bit, but and I mentioned I was coming back to it. Um, but can you tell us a little bit of what Jesus physical body reveals to us about um, God, about our own bodies and why it matters that Jesus took on a body like ours? Um. There's an old saying um, of, in the early church, what Jesus didn't assume, he doesn't redeem. Mm. Uh, so uh, Jesus takes on our human bodies and our physical human bodies to redeem them and with them to redeem the whole world. I don't, so um, the most important passage, there's two important passages in this respect. Uh, first of all, beginning of John's Gospel, where we are told uh, the Word, that's God's Son, became flesh. And tabernacle, that's a picture of the tabernacle temple, tabernacle among us, uh, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. So God delivers his gifts, his grace to us physically through Jesus. The, the, the fullness of his humanity, he be, the word became flesh, tabernacled among us, and we've beheld his glory. We see the glory of Jesus uh, in, in his humanity and in his humanity is fleshliness uh, 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 we receive grace upon grace and that's more and more and more and more grace from God um, and then God uh, uh, John concludes um, no one's ever seen God um, uh, except the one who is in the father's side uh, who makes him known to us or the other passage which I, I more directly deals with this is in Colossians chapter uh, 2 9 to 10. Uh, Paul here is talking about our union with Jesus and baptism and dying and rising with Jesus uh, the basic Christian message but there in that connection he says and in him that's in Christ uh, the man Jesus the fullness of deity dwells bodily. So all that he is as in his deity, his godness, his whole godness, and this is mind-boggling, is there packaged in his humanity. It dwells bodily in Jesus, in the body of Jesus. 
And uh, uh, then even uh, better than that, uh, 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 fullness dwells bodily, and we've come to fullness of life in him. Um, so the fullness of God and the fullness of what God has in store for us is packaged in the humanity of Jesus. So if we are to receive what God wants to give us, it's there physically in Jesus. Uh, it's not just a case of spiritual tripping or head tripping, but it has it's in the body of Jesus. Uh, so uh, what does it reveal what does the uh, physical body of Jesus reveal? It reveals the whole of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, 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 it, uh, it reveals everything about God that we can uh, have access this side, it, it, not only now, but forever in eternity. Uh, we will see that everything that God, if you like, the center of heaven and eternal life is the man Jesus. And we see that everything is there contained or reflected in his humanity and uh, are reflected to us in our humanity. We don't become angels, we become perfected human beings in heaven. And we then have access to everything that God is and has in store for us in the humanity of Jesus. And so we not only see God, but we see ourselves and see each other in the humanity of Jesus. So what is it? Why did Jesus take on a human body? Well, there you have it. Uh, to redeem our human bodies for eternal life. And not just individually, but to redeem the whole of humanity, to redeem the church and to redeem the world. Uh, uh, it's all there. Uh, uh, everything is packed together in that the package of his humanity uh, in the early church um, you uh, the teaching was that uh, 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 Jesus took his humanity into the Godhead he didn't just bring it into a relationship with God but his humanity is drawn into God himself uh, uh, so that we are now eternally part of as human beings, are part of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are drawn into that community, that divine, eternal community. Yeah, what a beautiful note to end on. And hopeful. There's so much hope in that for us as we think about the topic of our bodies and what it means to be created in God's image. Um, and so for those of you tuning in, please don't forget to pick up Wonderfully Made by Dr. Kleinig. Um, Wonderfully Made, a Protestant theology of the body. We will post links here. Um, and we'll also post links to other things so that you can keep up with Dr. Kleinig's work. Um, and Dr. Kleinig, thank you so much for talking with us today, for sharing um, your insights on the body, what it means to be created in the image of God. Thank you very much, and God bless you, and in your broadcasting too, and in your work in this. It's very important. And uh, uh, you know, if I can just end with a little as aside here, I start off the book and said, uh, uh, my motto is, it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. One of the things that, at least in Australia, that's uh, put the Christian faith and the church on the nose is that in Australian terms, Christians are perceived as being killjoys. Negative, always complaining and being critical. Uh, uh, now, I think what's more, what we need as Christians is not just uh, to give, if you like, the, 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 the Christian faith in positive terms and not just to speak about it because people are surrounded by overblown hype that uh, that's not true but uh, 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 but uh, not just to talk about it but to actually model it 
And since we're obsessed with sexuality, it's to model it sexually. That's powerful, and that hits where it hurts for modern secular people. Um, they're fascinated with sexuality, but they really don't know what to do with it, not to make of it. Here's an opportunity for us uh, to uh, model it and show it to the world and to make show the beauty of uh, chastity, the beauty of marriage, the beauty of sexuality and um, God's creation of us as men and women. So the beauty of sexuality, but also then the beauty of gender as God designed um, to a world where uh, we're fascinated by that, but we don't know what to make of it. What a great benediction for this time to, instead of cursing the darkness, shine a light. And so with that, we will be done for today. Thank you, everybody who's been watching Lagos Live. We'll see you next.